Okay, so let's, let's get started again. Um, so new low bounds for general Boolean circuits don't come around that often, and there was one fairly recently by Sasha Kulikov and co-authors, a couple of whom are in the audience. Um, so Sasha will be telling us about this and related open questions. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, in fact, I'm not going to, to tell a lot about this, this new lower bound. Instead, I'm going to, to present you some, some open, some approaches that could potentially lead to, to new improved up, uh, lower bounds, okay? Uh, yeah, first let me fix the model. I probably don't need to do this, but still let me just remind you that we are dealing here with binary Boolean circuits with no restriction on, uh, on the basis, or on the out degree, or on the depth, okay? So there are three uh, well-known restricted circuit classes. The first one, is obtained if we restrict the basis, uh, namely the operation computed at each gate to be, I, to be equalized to conjunction or disjunction. In this case, we, we have monotone circuits. Another thing that we might potentially restrict is the depth of the circuit. In this case, we, we have constant depth circuits, for example, or logarithmic depth circuits. And the other thing that we, can, that we may restrict is the out degree of each gate. And in this case, we get formulas. So in this case, we have just just Boolean binary circuit, and it is, well, it can be easily seen that they correspond to straight line programs, right? Which is the, possibly the simplest, the simplest program for computing a Boolean function, okay? Uh, so, of course, the fundamental question is, for a given Boolean function, what is the minimum number of gates, or what is the minimum number of lines in a straight line program that computes this function? So more precisely, we're interested not in a single function, but usually we're interested in a sequence of functions, one for every input size, such that, uh, so that defines a language in NP and that does not have a polynomial size circuit. So if we are able to construct this, then we would prove that P is not equal to NP. And it seems that we are infinitely far from reaching this goal. Okay, so just if you count the number of functions on n variables, which is 2 to the 2 to the n, and compare it to the number of circuits of size less than 2 to the n divided by n, then you just get that there are not, uh, not enough circuits to compute all these functions. And this was shown by Shannon more than 70 or 80 years ago. So, and, we, and by doing this, we get this lower bound, 2 to the n divided by n. And it was proved by Lupanov that, uh, that in fact the hidden constant here can be, shown to, uh, can be shown to be equal to one. Namely, you can compute any Boolean function in size roughly two to the n, uh, two to the n divided by n without even a big O, okay? So when, and this argument is of course non-constructive. So it doesn't give us an explicit function which, uh, which has exponential circuit size. And by saying explicit, we usually mean a function from NP, but it differs in, in, in various papers. So sometimes, well, we don't even have a function from e, e to the NP, for example, even from larger classes. Okay. Uh, okay. Now let me, this is the outline of my talk. So I will start by, uh, by telling you some ideas of the gate elimination method, which is essentially the only known method for proving lower bounds for, for unrestricted circuits on one hand. On the other hand, we do not expect this method to give us lower bounds even of, of size 5n or, or something, not to say about superlinear lower bounds. And then I will uh, briefly review some of other approaches that could potentially lead to, to improved lower bounds. Okay, so Okay, the question here is how to prove, for example, a 3n lower bound for a Boolean function f. This is usually done as follows by gate elimination method. You first pick a function which is resistant to sufficiently many substitutions. For example, f could be a parity function, uh, and f is clearly resistant to n minus 1 uh, bit fixing substitutions, meaning that after any n minus 1 bit fixing substitutions, you have a function which is still not constant. So you need a circuit of some non-zero size to compute this function. And then you show that basically for any, for any circuit computing f, you, you, may, you can find a substitution that kills three gates. So by applying this process, for example, n minus one times, you get a lower bound three n minus three, okay? And this is essentially the whole method. 
So uh, the currently strongest lower bound, which we were able to, to get quite recently, is proved using this method. The corresponding function is, is a kind of parity, uh, but parity is resistant to bit fixing substitutions, and we need a function which is resistant to affine substitutions. Okay, so formally this is, this is known in a fine dispersor for sublinear dimension, and it is defined as follows. It is non-constant on any affine subspace of the Boolean hypercube of large enough dimension, namely of dimension, let, let it be, for example, square root of n. Okay, so it is, it is highly non-trivial to construct an explicit such function. But, but we, in, in our approach, we use such a function as a black box. So once again, it is a function which is resistant to n minus square root of n linear substitutions, which means that for us, it is enough to show that for any circuit, uh, we, uh, we can find an affine, substitutions, the, uh, an affine substitution that kills slightly more than three gates. Okay, so this fancy, this 3 plus 1 over 86 comes from, from the fact that we use some, some tricky complexity measure of a circuit that keeps track not only about the number of gates but also about some additional parameters. Okay, uh, so what, what should be noted here is that if you consider all previous proofs of lower bounds, which are roughly 2n, 2.5n, and 3n, they are proofed for functions for which we know how to compute them by circuits of size 6n. Each of them can be computed by a circuit of size 6n. So among all these proofs, only for the affine dispersor, we still don't know whether it is possible to compute it by a linear, circuits, uh, by a linear circuit or not. So this is my first open problem. So is it possible to show, probably non-constructively, that there exists an affine dispersor for, for sublinear dimension that has linear circuit size? Okay. Uh, let, me, let me also mention another open problem. So uh, in an affine dispersor, we do allow affine substitutions, and we would like our function to be non-constant after sufficiently many uh, affine substitutions. But we can go further, and we, we may allow also to make quadratic substitutions. So what we've recently shown together with, with Sasha Golovnyov is that if you construct a function which is non-constant, so a function in NPO, in some larger class, or even with some small number of outputs, with the following property. It is not constant on any algebraic variety, which is defined as a set of common roots of, say, 2n polynomials of degree 2, such that the set is not so small. So if it, if it is not constant on any such variety, then for such function, we, we have uh, an a slightly more improved lower bound. It is something like 3.1n. So it is still a very tiny improvement, but still. So it is better than the, uh, the previous lower bound. So currently, we do not know how to, how to construct such a function. So your previous open problem, what's known over the circuit size of the uh, explicit dispersor? Uh, of an affine dispersor. So if I'm not mistaken, if you then the construction by Bensasson and Caparty has circuit size something like n cube. Mm. So I've, I've never written down this, so I've just, I've just checked this on, on the paper, but yeah. So you should not take this for granted. Uh, right, so an affine dispersor is still probably a candidate for, uh, for a nonlinear lower bound. Okay, so another, so an, an issue with, with, the, uh, with the gate elimination proofs is the following. When proving, say, a four, suppose you would like to prove a 4n lower bound using gate elimination. So to do this, you do the following. You show that for any circuit, you, may, you can find a substitution that removes four gates from this circuit. So while doing this, you first need to go through many cases of, of how the circuit looks like. But even when you remove four gates, you need to go through all possible subcases when some two of these four gates coincide. And this gives you many, many, many subcases. And this makes all these gate elimination proofs very boring and tedious. Okay, so this is some informal explanation of why gate elimination is probably not the method for proving uh, nonlinear lower bounds, but 
There is also a formal explanation. So when proving a lower bound using a gate elimination, you basically show that for any circuit you might, you may find a good substitution. And recently we were able to construct functions or circuits for which no substitution of the form uh, x uh, replaced by any function of any, uh, on any other variables uh, can remove more than five gates from this circuit. So definitely if Mm, definitely, if we would like to prove a stronger than 5 and lower bounds, it is not enough to construct some fancy new disperser, for example. We need some new ideas. We need to extend the, the gate elimination method somehow. Okay. Uh, okay, now let me, let me proceed to other approaches. So, one... Oh, yeah, yeah. How big is the circuit, actually, for which you do this? Sorry? How big is the circuit for which you... Mm. So I guess uh, we can do this even for the linear size circuits. So, so the construction of the of the circuit is. Mm. So the the circuit looks like uh, as follows. So you take basically any any function of uh, any circuit on on n variables, which probably depends essentially on all of them. And then you replace every input of, of, this, of this circuit with a majority of three bits. <laughs> okay, so, and, th and this is the basic construction. So it is not difficult to, to show that if you replace one, any of these two bits, any of, of the bits by, by any other function, then you can in a sense, suppress this substitution by, by putting constants here, right? And for this reason, and, and the size of this block is five. Oh, this is hand, wa hand waving, but. So the circuit doesn't compute the dispersor in particular? No. Yeah, okay. So yeah, it, yeah. It, it, <laughs> so it you're not really using the fact that like, right, like, like right. you're not even using the fact that the circuit yeah. computes the function in this yeah, case. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. So it, it might compute a dispersor. So if, if this function is particularly difficult, that it computes a dispersor probably of dimension 2n over 3 or something. Uh, so do I get it right that uh, for uh, quadratic dispersors, uh, probabilistically, they do exist. Yeah. yeah. Which means that uh, for, say, uh, the second level of polynomial hierarchy, we do have uh, 3.1, yes? Right, right, which is. Okay. <laughs> which is probably not that interesting, but. Uh, well, yeah? They even have into the case size. Huh? They have even have into the case size, so it's fine, okay. But this is true, right? It's still. <laughs> Um, um, okay, so for, for, for multi-output functions, so it is natural to, to ask whether our lower bounds uh, get larger if we, are, uh, if, we, if we ask to compute several outputs instead of, instead of, uh, instead of just one. Uh, so it seems to be more difficult, of course, but unfortunately we do not know how to prove this. So if you consider functions with smaller of n outputs, then we do not know any, uh, any lower bounds stronger than that what I already presented to you. Okay? So we just do not know how to exploit the fact that we have many outputs, but not just one. So if you allow, for example, for, uh, n outputs, so uh, yeah, for n outputs we can easily kind of lift any lower bound like 3n to 4n for example and this is just because you have you need n additional gates to compute the outputs so this is the whole argument okay uh, uh, but if we are talking about small number of, uh, of outputs then we still don't know how, how to use this so this is uh, this is an my other open problem that try to prove, for example, 5n lower bound for an n to n function. Yeah. So considering multiple outputs can only increase um, like, the, like if by a factor of 2 or something like that, um, the constant, um, because you can look at the uh, inner product with, with n new, new order n new variables. 
and make it a single value function? I'm not no, sure. Oh, maybe not. Probably works in the in the arithmetic setting, but not in the Boolean setting. Sorry. Yeah, at least it is not immediate for me. I think you said it's right. Okay, so let me also another another probably natural question is: Are there any other approaches for proving lower bounds other than the gate elimination? And in fact, I know just just two of them, and both of them can only prove to n lower bound for some reason. So the first of them is, is an old paper by Blum and Sason. Uh, what they prove is that if you want to compute simultaneously the disjunction and conjunction, then, uh, then the optimal way for doing this is just compute them as two independent trees. So you have two trees of, of, of n minus one gates. And what they do actually, so, uh, the first thing to note is that for, for such two functions, you cannot proceed by gate elimination. Because if you, if you assign a constant to any variable, then you kill immediately either a conjunction or disjunction, right? So what they do instead, they, uh, they use an argument like this. So take a function, if, if it is, take a circuit, I'm sorry, if it is not two independent trees, then let's try to reconstruct it a little bit. And in the end, they arrive to two independent trees of size n minus one. Okay, so the, the main idea is circuit reconstruction. So another another proof was given by Chashkin in in eighty in ninety four. I'm sorry. So and here the function which is uh, which uh, which is considered is is just a linear function. So A is a matrix, so we multiply, and the, this is actually a parity check matrix for, for having codes. So this is a matrix of size log n by n. So and, uh, for this function, what he shows is that in any circuit which computes, uh, which computes this function, there should be at least n gates of out degree at least two. Then just by counting the number of wires, you get, uh, you get the desired lower bound. For both of these proofs, I have no idea how to extend them to prove something stronger than 2n. So this is my, my next open problem. So it would be nice to come up with some non-gate elimination proof of, of, of some lower bound stronger than 2n. OK. Uh, OK, so the next probably natural question is, what can be shown for symmetric functions? So symmetric functions are, are popular candidates for, for many other modules. So we, we do know uh, nonlinear lower bounds for formulas. We do know exponential lower bounds for, for constant depth circuits. At the same time, if we compute them by circuits, then it is not difficult to do this in, in size 5n or even in size 4.5n. Okay, so this in particular shows that well, that some restricted models are quite weak, while these uh, general circuits are quite strong, right? So what is known about symmetric functions is that for many of them, we do know a lower bound 2.5n, and for all of them, we know uh, an upper bound 4.5n, and this is actually done through the function which is denoted by, denoted by some n, which takes n bits and outputs the logarithm of n bits, which represents the binary, uh, in binary, the sum of the n bits. Okay? So there is a small gap, and well, I, I still consider this as an interesting problem to, I mean, to at least to reduce this gap. So it, it would be interesting to find, uh, to find exactly the complexity of this function, which is probably one of the most basic symmetric functions. Okay, so the next, uh, the next question is how we are proving lower bounds is related to satisfiability algorithms. And this was, uh, this was recently shown uh, in a, uh, uh, by, by Williams that by, by improving circuit SAT algorithms, for, uh, SAT algorithms for, a for a particularly circuit class, you actually prove circuit lower bounds. Okay, so in this, uh, uh, in this direction, uh, it was proved by, by Emmanuel and, uh, and to his co-authors, I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot the names, that if you improve 
if you come up with a non-trivial algorithm for checking satisfiability of circuits of size 2 CEN, then actually you prove a lower bound CEN. Okay? And this unfortunately does not currently give us improved circuit lower bound because all that we know is that, uh, uh, is that we can uh, check satisfiability of circuits of size slightly uh, less than 3N. So in order to, in order to get uh, some new lower bounds through, through this framework, we need to, uh, to design an algorithm that checks satisfiability of circuits of size 7N, for example. And unfortunately, we do not know how to do this. And uh, at the same time, so a, a trivial open problem is, of course, to improve this result. But what is probably more interesting is to show that uh, checking satisfiability of circuits of size CN in some non-trivial time imply CN circuit lower bounds. Okay, so I mean improving this result. Okay, so the the next the next question. So. Uh, we do know that most of the functions require exponential circuit size. So what about the following approach? Let's take some sufficiently large constant. Well, for example, 20. Uh, for we do know that there is a circuit of size 100 uh, for a fun uh, that there is a function. I'm sorry, of 20 bits that requires circuits of size at least 100. So why not to try to cook a family of functions out of this function? Okay, so let's let's fix such a function f, and let's define the function g as follows. So we just split the, the input of size n into chunks of size 20, and for each of them we apply the function f. Okay, so for such a function, it is natural to expect that an optimal circuit looks like this, right? So so we have n over 20 independent copies of variables. For each of them, we need to apply our function f. So it is not at all clear how like, like mixing these circuits might help us. So it is natural to expect that such a circuit would be, would be optimal for our function G. And this would, mean a, this would give us a function of, size, uh, of circuit size 5N, right? At the same time, we have no idea how to prove this. And, and moreover, this is just not true for some functions. Let me, let me show you what is known. So the corresponding effect is called mass production. So we say that this, uh, this effect occurs when computing two copies of some function is, can be done by a much smaller circuit than just by computing, uh, uh, by, by combining two circuits independently. So what we do know is that if the corresponding uh, function g is very simple, then there is no mass production effect. So if you, for example, if you need to compute parities of n bits and of, for, of some other n bits, then uh, the best thing that you can do is to compute them independently. At the same time, if we are talking not about such a simple function as parity, but uh, about a function which has very high circuit complexity, then it is actually known that computing it twice is almost the same as computing it once. It was proven by Uchlik uh, many years ago. Okay. Uh, okay, so, and it seems to be that we do not know much about this mass production effect, so this is my my next uh, open problem. So it would be interesting to understand at least a little bit more about the functions avoiding the mass production effect. This yeah. <coughs> well-known example, matrix vector product. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is yeah. easier than this. Yeah, so it is not effect. avoiding the mass production effect, yeah. yeah. And I would like a function, some probably simple function, which avoids it. So the reason for the um, I, I can't say the author's name, uh, the 74. Oh, click if I pronounce it correctly, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Um, is that if you look at um, the optimal com construction of, of circuits for a hard function, you end up like computing every function on a small number of bits. Yeah. And you can sort of reuse that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, like just to say that a bit more, like, I mean, really that, that works like, you can rephrase Russell's comment as saying, like, if instead of two there, you put like a constant t, uh -huh. like as soon as t is big enough, you yeah. get no gain at all, right? Exactly. So as soon as t is small of two to the n divided by n, yeah. even more, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I, I, I just simplified the, the, the result here, but what he actually proved you are right is that for, for much larger values of t. Hmm. No. Okay, so I, let me then proceed to the, to the last, to the last, uh, uh, to the last section. Uh, another natural question is, uh, okay, so we would like to prove a uh, super linear lower bound. And so does it help if we reduce the depth of the circuit to be logarithmic? We cannot ask it to be smaller than logarithmic, of course, but what if we restrict the depths to be logarithmic? Unfortunately, even in this setting, we do not know how to show this. And, uh, but of course, we do know that if we restrict the, the depths to be constant, then we do know uh, uh, even exponential lower bounds. And there is a well-known result by Valiant. Uh, it should be probably Valiant 77, which says that if you prove a strong enough lower bound for depth three circuit, uh, depth three circuits in particular, you would like to find a function which cannot be computed by an OR uh, of that many uh, CNFs, such that each CNF has at most square root n variables in every clause. So if you construct such a function, then you get a nonlinear lower bound for a function uh, uh, in the setting uh, where the circuit is, re is requested to, to have a logarithmic depth. Okay, so currently, uh, of course, we do not know how to do this. Uh, well, this is kind of an obvious open problem. So this is the best we can, uh, we can prove right now, roughly two to the square root of n, I mean to this depth three circuit. But this is an obvious open problem. Let me probably uh, show you one more less obvious open problem. So what we do know uh, for, for depth three circuit, slightly better lower bounds are known for the, for the case where we consider or of k CNFs where k is a constant. So in this, in this setting, assume that k is a constant. Okay, in this case, we, we can prove lower bounds two to the n over k. So this is a, a result by Paturi, Pudlik and, and Zayn. Moreover, Paturi, Sachs, and Zane three years ago proved that for k equal to two, it is even possible to prove, uh, well, in a sense, an optimal lower bound, two to the n. Okay, so, so now the question is whether we can use this actually non-trivial result to, to get something for unrestricted circuits. In particular, uh, yeah, this is the same, uh, the same result by Valiant. Uh, uh, let me phrase it as follows. So if you have a circuit of size n and, and depth log n, then it is possible to transform it into the following depth three circuit. So this is a norm of that many CNFs such that each CNF has at most square root uh, 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 variables in every clause. Okay, so what we can show as a, like as a counterpart is the following. So if you have a circuit of size s, and no matter what is the depth of this circuit, we can transform it into, into a depth three formula with the following parameters. Here we have a constant, uh, which constant is not at all important at this point. And here we have size two to the S divided by 2.5, okay? So this is like a nice counterpart, which does not give any new lower bounds. But still, I mean, it is interesting whether it holds in general, whether we can uh, whether we can transform any, uh, any small enough circuit into some non-trivial depth three formula. Okay, and this is, this is my last question. So for example, it would be nice if we can prove that any uh, circuit of si with, with S gates can be transformed into a depth three formula with, with these parameters. So it is two to the S, two to the S over four, two CNFs. So if we, if we can do this, then just by plugging in the result by Paturi, Sachs, and Zane, we get a lower bound for N. Okay. Yeah, and this is, um, yeah. Okay, I, I forgot about this, this um, extension of this question. So more generally, it would be interesting to, to check whether any linear size, uh, any linear size circuit can be transformed into some non-trivial, uh, into some non-trivial depth three formula. By non-trivial, I mean that it has size 
smaller than 2 to the n here, and it has some constant size CNFs here. Okay? Yeah, and this is finally it. And this is just some summary of all, of all the lower bounds, of all the open questions. Thank you. Is this any projection dispersor? Is this a big form of a fan dispersor? 